Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our chats with Emily as we are calling our readings through all of the poems of Emily Dickinson contained in the Johnson edition. We turn now to poem 73, Who Never Lost Our Unprepared. One of those amazing little theodicies, as we will sometimes uh, define it. You'll remember in our introductory set of comments and our assumption is that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net. Again, our playlist is Chats with Emily. In that introductory set of comments, you'll remember that we commented on our big five, as we call it. Epistemology, what you can know. Ontology, who you are. Psychology, the study of the individual mind. Sociology, the study of the collective mind. It was that last one, theodicy, though, that... Uh, often students are very interested in this question that Emily keeps grappling with. Dude, why does there got to be so much pain and suffering in the world? Like, why? Why do I got to go through so much garbage to get the thing that I want? Well, we're going to be playing uh, this project again. Uh, and of course, this is going to take us back to poem 67. Success is counted sweetest by those who ne'er succeed. To comprehend a nectar requires sorest need. You remember what she said, not one of all the purple hosts who took the flag today can tell the definition so clear of victory as he, defeated, died, on whose forbidden ear the distant strains of triumph burst agonized and clear. And you'll remember that in that previous lecture, we commented on the fact that Emily seems to suggest that it's really only when you lose that you can actually win. What an amazing idea. Now, we just finished with poem 72, uh, Glowing is Her Bonnet, and now we will turn to this little poem. Now, the Oxford scholar David Priest um, who's been so influential in the way so many of us read these poems, loves to start for this poem with the great writer Aeschylus and his famous The Agamemnon, where you'll remember in that poem, we've given full lectures on that, on that I call it a poem because it's so beautifully written, uh, in that play, in that, drum, in that dramatic work, we've given full lectures at LearnStrong.net on it. You'll remember that early on, one of the things he says in this play is things go by turns. And so we're going to see this kind of back and forth happening. Of course, we're going to see it here played out from the bad to the good. So for, notice it, when we read this, we're going to go from loss to success. We're going to go from thirst to uh, tamarind fruit. We're going to go from uh, the hard marching of a, uh, of a conquistador, Pizarro, to his ability to see the Pacific in present day Peru. Uh, and then finally, we're going to go from all of those um, challenges, right? Life's scars to hopefully, uh, Emily will say, angels admitting those individuals to heaven. Notice the military language as well at the end of this little poem. Poem 73. Who never lost are unprepared a coronet to find. Who never thirsted flagons and cooling tamarind. Who never climbed the weary league can such a foot explore the purple territories on Pizarro's shore? How many legions overcome, the emperor will say? How many colors taken on Revolution Day? How many bullets barest? Hast thou the royal scar? Angels, right, promoted on this soldier's brow. Now, the, the theory here, the, the, the thesis that stands behind this is, again, success is counted sweetest by those who dare to succeed. And you'll remember, to comprehend a nectar requires source need. You only know how good a drink tastes when you are really, really thirsty. We'll play the same game again here. Who never lost are unprepared a coronet to find. Now, readers of Emily's day would immediately understand coronet as the crown of life of Revelation 2.10. Um, readers today maybe not so easily find it there. In other words, you're not going to get your crown of life if you don't go through some losses. Then, who never thirsted, now for sure we're back to poem 67, to comprehend a nectar requires source need, who never thirsted flagons. By the way, note the use of the word flagons at the beginning of line 4 and not at the conclusion of line 3. And cooling tamarind, the, uh, it could be here the fruit, the tamarind, or it could be the shade of the tamarind tree, either way. Um, and a uh, priest will point out as well that this use of tamarind may, for Emily, have come from her study uh, in chapter 4 of Mrs. Glasgow's Wives and Daughters, where Mrs. Gibson, describing the life of a doctor's apprentice, says, quote, And on Sundays he shall have a taste of tamarinds to reward him for his weekly labor at pill-making, end quote. It's possible that that's where it came from. And then we're back to who. Notice, it's who, who, and then it's how many, how many. So the balancing is brilliant here. 
who never climbed the weary league can such a foot explore the purple's territories notice the purple color was used as well in 67 of success on Pizarro's shore now there is an interesting argument to be made that when we go back to poem 15 and we look at the very last lines. He reaches town at nightfall, he stops at every door. Who looks for him at morning, I pray him to explore the lark's pure territory or the lapwing shore. So we're kind of back to that idea of exploration. Only notice here, Emily's playing with Francesco Pizarro, right? That Spanish conquistador who, man, he did some pretty wretched things we know from history. Um, he defeated the Inca, um, uh, in many ways, defeated the Inca um, Empire. And you'll remember that sometime in January of 1535, he will found the city of Lima and is assassinated in 1541. Some will say not given, uh, not enough punishment for the things that he did. But for Emily, what's her point? Well, it's the exact same point that Keats will make upon first looking into Chapman's Homer. Then felt I like some watcher of the stars when a new planet swims into his kin, or like that Cortez when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise silent upon the peak in Darien. And we give it the lectures on that at learnstrong.net. Of course, Keats got his, his history wrong, right? It was Balboa, it wasn't Cortez. And here, notice it's Pizarro. In other words, there is a tendency, we saw this in our study of Whitman as well, right? Uh, in Talks with Walt. There was a tendency for Emily and Walt to kind of celebrate these conqueror types. For Walt, obviously, it was Columbus. But the point here that she's making is, until you've taken the long, what she calls, weary league, the, the hard journey, you're never going to be able to enjoy the scenery of seeing the Pacific, right? Maybe for the first time. Then she'll go to this military, you know, kind of hard language. How many legions overcame? Overcome, the emperor will say. Notice we go from conquistadors to emperors. How many colors taken? We come back to, of course, poem 67, taking of the flag. On Revolution Day, by the way, notice the three of how many here. How many bullets barest? In other words, how many shots did you sustain? Hast thou the royal scar? And it, and it is, I think, a possibility that Emily is writing to herself as she asks the question, do you have the royal scar? Do you have the evidence of the pain and suffering that you've had to go through, you've had to endure? And then the word angels with an exclamation point, right, promoted, in other words, admitted, on this sh a soldier's brow. In other words, 2A, what's the point of a little poem like this? Well, I think you have to go through lots of suffering to gain the reward. You have to find your royal scar. In other words, when bad things happen, back to the theodicy observation, stop asking why did this happen to me, and rather learn to ask why did this happen for me. It's not, again, it's not that we want bad things to happen. We don't celebrate suffering with this view. No, no. But we know it's coming. And we know that out of the pain and suffering, maybe there can be what she calls the royal scar. Something can be learned. Something can be gained. Uh, to be, I love her word choice, um, and I love that she assumes knowledge, for example, of Pizarro, for example. At 3A, well, I cannot help but think of our Dante's Divine Comedy. We've given full lectures at LearnStrong.net. What is it that Dante the Pilgrim is kind of learning that you don't go to hell, but rather through hell? You've got to get through it, you've got to get on to Purgatorio, and then finally to Veredicio. And it is the journey that matters, not the destination. And of course, we could say the same thing in many ways about our study of Milton's Paradise Lost, also, we've given full lectures at LearnStrong.net. You can run both of those titles to ground. In other words, think about it. Adam and Eve have to earn the right to leave Eden. Now, that's a strange way to say it. A man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree brought death into the world and all our woe. But think about, the as, as we commented at the very end of that series of talks, that Adam and Eve, they leave, and out they go, what? Hand in hand. In other words, off they go together on their journey. That, I think, is maybe to some degree what Emily is channeling here, finally at 3B. How are we going to own a set of lines like this? Well, what was a time in your life when you learned through pain? That is to say, you gained your royal scar. And I'm wondering if we are at poem 73, and we have 1,775 poems to complete this study. I wonder if reading Emily's poetry is gaining a royal scar as well. Thank you.